keep us in chains By a show of hands Who else is sick and tired of the same What percent Trying to keep us small Trying to keep us from getting out Minimizing the struggles they've caused Saying we're not working hard enough we really should stop this fighting. Otherwise, we'll miss the fireworks. There won't be any fireworks. And here we go. And welcome, everybody, to Suck It! I am the great and powerful King of Kings, Prince of all that is awesome, Derek. How are you today on this Thursday, January 28th of the year? That is 2021. I hope you guys are enjoying your week. It is Friday Eve. <clears throat> Excuse me. Friday Eve, you know, only one more day to the weekend. And, you know, things are starting to balance out a little bit, kind of, sort of, maybe. Not really, but, you know, at least that's what people have us believe. So, hat, hat, you know, my hat's off to the Matrix. It's doing a good job. It's working. Hopefully Keanu comes and saves us anytime now. Come on, Neo. Where you at? I'm sick and tired of this, but, you know, whatever. So, you know, this week has been very interesting. Um, Monday, I talked to a, um, a life coach. Tuesday, I talked to a hypnotherapist. Wednesday, I talked to a um, another type of therapist um, and uh, an author, and then today, I'm talking to someone that's none of the above. However, she is an author. But she's an everyday Jane, for lack of a better term. Which is exactly why I'm so happy to have her on. Because she took her journey with mental health and decided to put it in a book to help others people like her. Which is almost identical to what I do every day with this show. Um putting it out there for the world to see to hopefully help one person. And she's done that with her book. And I am extremely excited um, to talk about the book, which, by the way, is called, I just had it, where'd it go? Anxiety Diary of an Ordinary Girl, which debuts on, debuts, comes out on February 10th. So without any further ado, let's just get right to this conversation, because it's going to be a fun and interesting conversation. Please welcome to the show, Miss Carrie Thompson. Hey, Derek. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited to talk to you tonight about the book and everything that's developed since then. Yes, absolutely. Because um, your story, you know, triggered me um, in, a, in a good way. Um, because it's it's not like you're, you know, someone that ha has been dealing with this your entire life. Or maybe you have and just didn't know how to deal with it properly like I did. Because you got diagnosed in 2016, I got diagnosed in 2017, but I was 37 when it happened. Um, I fought it forever. Um, but at the same time, you know, prior to me doing this show and, you know, I mean, I was a stand I'm, I'm a stand-up comedian, but I'm nowhere near at the level of, like, you know, fame. So I'm just an average, everyday person as well. And when I started this show, it was like, okay, how can I help more people like me? And that was the exact same idea that you have behind your book, and I just find that fucking awesome and i just want to say thank you for that number one but then number two you know most people would hide and you know and uh, shy away from talking about it and you don't so you know what exactly led a to your diagnosis what was that final breaking point for you and then what have you done since then obviously you wrote the book but what have you done since then to kind of like you know start your journey toward healing i mean we're never going to be healed but at the same time you know there's a healing process so what exactly you know have you been doing and what exactly got you to the point where you had to get diagnosed in 2016. so i had actually gone to ohio state which we know you're a fan um and after school i moved down to charlotte north carolina and thought i was going to start this great career but i had graduated in 2009 so the job market was terrible mm -hmm and eventually decided to go back to school to be an accountant because my undergrad was in marketing and there really was no jobs at the time. So everyone in my family is an accountant, engineer, or healthcare worker. So it's kind of like runs in my blood to have that like math and science background. So I thought accounting, great idea, great job security. 
along with that comes taking the CPA exam, which for accountants is a four part exam. There's a financial section, an auditing section, a regulatory section and a business section. And the tests are extremely difficult to pass. So because my background in school was great grades, 4.0 GPA, I was thinking I'm going to go into these tests getting 100% on every single one, <clears throat> which I'll give you some background on the studying on that. Basically, I didn't work really for six months. I bartended on the weekends. That was it. Literally all day, every day, eight to 10 hours, I studied for the test because I thought I was going to get 100, even though I only needed a 75 to pass. So by the third test, I was so badly burnt out that I started having panic attacks in the middle of the night. And I think a lot of people with anxiety have this happen to them when they have their first panic attack or they first start feeling anxious, but I thought I was literally having a heart attack. Yeah. So that was like the beginning of me going to get diagnosed because I was having these panic attacks every night because of all the studying I was doing. And I ended up going to a cardiologist. I mean, it was crazy. So I went there. I, my doctor was like, well, you just have anxiety. And I was like, okay. So we tried Xanax to kind of like fend off those panic attacks, but that didn't end up really working that well. Um, so eventually I went back to a psychiatrist years later and got fully diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Um, but that was where it stemmed from. So the studying and like finally figuring out like, oh, this craziness going on in my body is just like stress and anxiety related. It's not like a heart problem or yeah. something like that, you know? Yeah. Those, that first panic attack. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. I mean, and if you don't know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I remember countless times I'm like, I'm having a heart attack. You know, it was that bad. Um, and my doctors were like, no, it's just, you know, you're just having acid reflux. Oh no, it's just this, it's just this and this, this. And I'm like, you know, um, no, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm bipolar. There's so obviously it's anxiety. There's something else here. And they're like, no, it's just this. And they're like, I'm like, no, it's not. And it, it, it just progressively got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And they put me on Xanax as well. That did not work. And then they put me on Clonopin, which is even worse because it's mm -hmm. it's even a higher dose of a narcotic so i'm like you know screw it I, I use cbd and thc now i don't mess with either one of those i still take my you know my antidepressants i take lexapro um but as far as anxiety goes herbal all the way because i not touching any of those narcotics yeah that's the kind of the way i felt too in the beginning i mean still now with the xanax for sure because it's so highly addictive and i'm really really focus on if you can treat something holistically, you totally should. So that's great for you that you do that. Um, I did. So it was a journey, obviously. Like when I went to the doctor first, like my general practitioner, at least I had a name to put to it with the anxiety thing. Like, oh, you're anxious. Oh, it's anxiety. But it really did take a long time for me to realize what generalized anxiety disorder was. Um, and through that time, like I was put on Zoloft actually at first um, when the Xanax just wasn't enough to, you know, deal with a full day of that type of anxious feeling because you know how that stuff is like Xanax and Klonopin. It's an in the moment relief, yeah. but it's not like a 24 hour a day maintenance relief. So we tried Zoloft. It actually created suicidal ideations for me. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about my story, but go ahead. Continue. Yeah. So that was crazy. Um, and I was so anti-medication after that. I was refusing for years to try another medication. It took until I had a full on mental breakdown at the end of 2019 for me to finally be like, I can't even fix this in therapy because I'm not even well enough to like drive myself places. Like I'm, I'm going to have to use chemical intervention to be able to get to a place where I can holistically treat myself. Yeah. 
So I finally tried again three years later and I, I was on Lexapro. Um, it was fine, but wasn't doing too much for me. And now I'm on Paxil and it works great, but yeah, I'm interested to hear your story because it was an experience for sure. So Zoloft was the first one they put me on when I got diagnosed in, uh, um, 2018. So, um, I was 37 at the time and, um, that was the first one they put me on and, uh, about a week into it, I think it was, um, it was a Friday. It was November 2nd. I'll never forget it. 2018. Um, I was driving back home from getting my, my now ex-wife, uh, my, well, my wife at the time, a, uh, a Christmas, excuse me, a birthday present. Cause that was her birthday. The second. And on my way home, I had this overwhelming urge to just say, fuck it. And I was getting ready to, I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to drive. Oh, look, there's a cliff over there. I'm going to drive through this intersection at 100 miles an hour and then hit that cliff and just end it all. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a great idea. And, you know, I, I started speeding up and then a song came on the radio that was very, very anti-suicide. And I was like, oh, wait a second. That's not good. So I pulled over. I immediately called my doctor. And she's like, yeah, don't ever take Zoloft again. And I'm like, well, you're the one who gave it to me. Um, and then she switched me up on Lexapro the very next day. But, you know, it was a mistake. No big deal. But, like, she should have waited until I came off the Lexapro. And the Zoloft completely before putting it. And so I had, like, a mix of two different drugs in me over a 24-hour period. So that that Sunday... So now we're on the fourth. I literally have no recollection of. It's oh like my gosh. that day does not exist because that that Saturday, um, I took the Lexapro, and then that Sunday I was just completely gone. Like I have no recollection of that day. I know I went to work, and I know that supposedly I locked myself in my office. I was a store manager for a grocery store at the time. Locked myself in the office, and everyone that came into the office, I just told them that I was going to kill myself. Like, uh, I don't remember this at all, but this is countless people have told me the story. I was like, Jesus. But yeah, so yeah, Zoloft did not work. And, and then when I went back to the doctor, you know, a couple weeks later, they were like, okay, let's try to figure out why, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're good now. And they were like, has anybody else been in your family that was diagnosed with, you know, I'm like, yeah, my mom has bipolar as well. And so is my brother. And she's like, well, what does your mom take? So I called the mom and she's like, yes, yeah, um. I take Lexapro and, you know, Zoloft made me suicidal. And I told her that. And she goes, yeah, that's actually a genetic thing. Your genetic code allows us, if you would, if we would have known that beforehand, I'm like, we didn't ask. Um, we wouldn't have given you Zoloft. I'm like, oh, my God. Because it, if it could actually match the genetic marker. I was like, oh, that makes it that much easier. But it's good to know. But, again, at the same time, at the very beginning, we're all guinea pigs. I mean, isn't that what that's, you felt like? He, dude. I literally tell people this all the time because it, it's a really hard conversation for me to have people have with people about medication because there are just so many parts to it. And like people always ask me if I advocate for medication and the answer is always I advocate for a holistic approach. But if you need medication, I think it's good to get on it. But I think the issue is the education doesn't exist from a lot of practitioners where when you're going in to inquire about medication, I think you should be given a lot of background on what the potential side effects and potential repercussions of taking it are. Because I, I mean, I know in the beginning, and I don't know if you felt the same way, but when I first sought out medication, I was like, damn, this is about to be a quick fix. Like, I'm going to get on these meds and feel great the next day. Cause like, yep. you know, our first experience was with a benzo, like a fast acting medication with no side effects, basically other than being tired. So I had no idea that it was going to make me feel crazy. And yeah, it's experimentation. No one tells you right away that you have four to six weeks every time you change a dose and then at like maybe six months before you know if it's working. And then if it's not, you have to try again. Yeah. That, that, that's the part that kind of gets me the worst. So like, you know, if Zoloft were to work for me, it would have taken four to six weeks, but we knew it wasn't working within the first week. Cause it was already given. So the good effects 
take four to six weeks. The bad effects, you'll know those right mm-hmm. away. And that absolutely scares the shit and terrifies the absolute ever living hell out of me because there's people out there that are in worse shape and I don't want to say weaker, but you know, that have worse, you know, con- symptoms and stuff like that. And they don't survive that. But then at the same time, why are we making drugs to help depression that cause suicidal thoughts? <laughs> why is that even a, 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 a thing? We should be like, let's go ahead and figure out why that does that and not do that anymore. But no, it, it, it's, and I know it has to do with the serotonin levels and sometimes the SSRIs spike your serotonin levels and it drives you absolutely insane. I get that. But there's got to be a way, there's got to be a balance. And, I, and uh, yeah, I, I can go off on this for hours. Yeah, I just think that there's a lot of opportunity in the world of medica- or the world of medicine for, uh, medications for people with mental health issues. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I also think it's difficult because the brain is so complex. So it's very challenging to figure it out. But I do wish that, I mean, I'm grateful. The lady I see now, my psychiatrist, she is incredible. She is really good about education and preparing you and letting you be a part of the process. Like she actually pulled out like, medical journals and showed them to me. I was like, these are our options. You can go ahead and read like what the potential transient side effects would be. Like this one will agree with this body type, whatever. So that was nice, but I don't think a lot of people do that. No, no. Um, When I was first getting diagnosed, I went to a psychiatrist as well. And she talked to me for all of like maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, and immediately just put me on drugs. Um, and, you know, it just it was not cool. And then I switched to another psychiatrist, same thing. You know, now I don't even deal with a psychiatrist. My, my family doctor, you know, handles all my medications, and he just deals directly with my therapist. And that's so the two of them combined equal a psychiatrist. And she's like, hey, I think we should try this. Can you don't run up? Can you give me blood tests for this? Or do you have any of this? And they work together to figure it out. So that's my routine. But you know, I'm glad you were able to find psychiatrists, but it like I went to two and I was very, very unsuccessful. Yeah, that's what I've been told over time by many people is just like they are not getting that level of care that I get. I actually considered looking for somebody new for a little bit and then I was like, that's crazy. What are you thinking? Like she actually cares about you. Like I can send her a message and on through our little portal, she'll answer back right away. And yeah, she's just great. But I think there's just a lot more effort people could be putting in from the practitioner side to educate people before they start prescribing. I very much agree with that. And, you know, I I think we're, we're too drug dependent, you know, in this country, number one, Um, because there are so many other holistic things that have been proven to work that are still deemed illegal. Like, you know, Federally, you know, marijuana is still illegal, but has so many positive medicinal effects. And then, you know, thanks to Colorado, you know, mushrooms are illegal there. And they've been doing a bunch of, you know, studies on the therapies as, as far as the mind goes. And they actually came to a conclusion that, you know, for a brief period of time, it's always comes back, but it comes back in a worse state that in Mar- like that, um, Mushrooms actually reset your brain chemistry and you're when you if you're having a, a manic or depressive episode, when you come out of it, it's always going to be a little bit less. And, and it eventually just it helps decrease the amount of, you know, imbalance in your brain. And it's like, that is freaking amazing. Why aren't we legalizing this? Why are not we putting this in pill form? But oh, no, it, it's psychedelic. And, it, you know, the Pfizer doesn't have mushrooms growing out back because they don't have a cow field. But. That's where we're going to go ahead and just give you Xanax instead. I don't care. Yeah, I do. I do find the alternative medicine, like psychedelic developments that have been happening very fascinating, especially I'm sure like what you're talking about is like the micro dosing. Correct. Yes. Not, yeah. full, not full get yourself massively stoned. Right. Yeah. Just a micro dose, like maybe a half or, 
you know, whatever, a gram, you know, boiled in tea, it, you're going to still get psychedelic out of it, but it really just resets your brain chemistry. And it's, yeah. it's like, it's freaking amazing. Yeah. And I mean, too, like what I've heard is just like, it really helps people hone in on their creativity and their like open-mindedness. So I definitely think that's cool. And I think there's a lot coming as far as that research is concerned. Yeah. I, and I think, you know, more states are going to fight, you know, for this and that. And I think, you know, <clears throat> I think we learned a lot over the last year about who was our biggest advocate for safety. And we learned really quickly that it was not the drug companies and we, it was not the government at all. Um, they're too busy pointing blame. They're too busy, you know, blaming each other and trying to, you know, figure out who's right and everything else in between. But they didn't give a shit about the suicide rates being the highest they've ever been in this country. They didn't give a, a shit about the divorce rates being the highest they've ever been in this country. They haven't cared about any of that. They just care about who's politically in charge and how much money they can make. And that was a sad realization. And I think more people coming out of this are going to stand up, you know, for medicinal rights and per, you know, you know, not when I say medicinal, I meant medical. There we go. Medical rights in general, you know, for the American people. Yeah, there's so much I can say about that one. Like the past year has really inspired me to like really did inspire me partially to write my book because mental health is just so crucial right now and mental health awareness and mental health care, um, especially with the pandemic, because we were never we like humans aren't meant to be isolated. So I think that that had a, such a huge impact on people, you know? So yeah. I felt like there was no better time to start talking about my experience with mental health and like attempting to reach out and be a voice for people and an advocate for people that are struggling than during this time. Um, and I also think that, well, I'm hopeful that over the next couple of years, mental health care will become more of a priority um, to the administration or just the people in general. Obviously, I don't know a ton about like reforming laws or <laughs> anything, but I think that like health care for mental health issues needs to be made much more accessible. I think therapy needs to be made much more accessible. So many therapists don't take insurance and that's great. Like you can find an amazing therapist, but a lot of them cost $200 an hour. And yep. a lot of the people that need therapy can't afford that. So how do you get help? You, you can't, you don't have insurance. So you can't go to the doctor and then you can't go to therapy because you can't afford to go to therapy. So, but even, you know, with insurance, most insurances, you know, and companies that do take it, you know, it's considered a specialty. So even like, you know, on, the average, you know, plan where it's a twenty dollar copay for regular and then forty dollars for a specialist. You're still spending forty dollars a visit, so that could be a hundred and sixty bucks a month if you're just going once a week, and that's still a lot of money for people, you know. And that's that's even too much. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's that's just the the tip of the iceberg as far as it goes. You know, there's so much more to it. You know, it, it needs to. Uh, uh, we need to stop profiting off of people's, you know, well-being or lack thereof is better, a better choice of words. And I think that's yeah. that's one of the biggest issues we have in this country is that being that it's privatized, it is much cheaper and much more profitable to keep you sick and coming back for more every month than to just cure you and say, see you later. Oh, absolutely. For sure. And I just especially with mental health, it's, it's long-term. It's not like having a cold or a sinus infection or allergies. Like you, you have an issue and that issue might lead to other issues. Like you might start working on this one thing. So maybe you get diagnosed. Like somebody I talked to recently was misdiagnosed with depression. They actually had bipolar. So it was like a big experiment the whole time and they were struggling and suffering. And it is a long-term process and not just like from a medical perspective, but just from a self 
improvement and growth perspective. I mean, you need guidance, I think, which would come from like a therapist and then you're cont- like, it's a lifelong process. So I think it's, it's really hard for people to get started that really need that help because it is very, it's, it's very hard to access. Yeah, it is. So how do you handle How do you manage your anxiety now? Um, I love to talk about therapy. I just brought it up a little bit, but, um, I have been incredibly blessed with the best therapist out there. So a lot of what I've learned has come from her and, as we have grown our relationship over time, I've opened up more, which has allowed me to really focus on things that I really didn't realize were issues before. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the biggest things with just like self-discovery through that process, which you can totally do at home, but it was nice having somebody to guide me. So just like recognizing and acknowledging, like, for example, I have perfectionist tendencies. I wanted to get a hundred percent on those exams, but that's not reasonable. And my perfectionist tendencies just aren't reasonable. So that creates a lot of anxiety. Do I think someday I won't have my perfectionist tendencies at all? No. Can I do better to recognize them? And when I'm having a moment or start to panic, be like, okay, this is happening because of said tendency. This is how we're going to move through it. Same with my control issues. I have major control issues. I'm super type A and I had to admit, okay, you have control issues because at first I didn't want to. So just a lot of self-realization and working through that and just acknowledging, acknowledgement of habits you can change, patterns you can change. So that's one thing. Uh, Another thing I always tell people is don't give up on tactics or techniques that you've either found online, heard from a friend or gotten from a therapist. I'm a quick fix person. And so I want something to work the first time. I don't want to try again and again and again. So anytime I was given a tip or trick or technique from my therapist or friend or whoever, I would try it maybe two to three times and it wouldn't work. And the biggest example is probably like toxic thought processes and fear-based thinking Um, I I think like the biggest thing for me is remembering that you, like I spent 30 years of my life building up to this point. So it's going to take a really long time to fix it. So sticking to the process, when you find something that works, you need to stick to it, even though it may take years to actually fully impact your thought processes or the way that you're handling stuff in life. So for me, it's just like, when I am in fear-based thinking, I make sure to stop myself and I'm like, okay, like this is irrational. This is really the truth. And that's like another big part of like how I try to work through my anxiety is having truth-based thinking because a lot of anxious people, like anxious is fear-based. So their thoughts or automatic thoughts come from a place of like doomsday planning, as I like to call it. And it's just to remind myself, like, that's not the truth. So like looking for the truth in anything, like if you can prove that something horrible is not going to go wrong, then you at least have something to hold on to. And I love to use exercise as well. Like that's a huge thing for me. Uh, Exercising. I do write a gratitude journal, Um, talking openly with people about it's really helpful. So those are probably the the best techniques for me. Um, Are you medicated at all other than the Paxil? I have. So I take Trazodone to sleep, but it's not really for the anxiety. It's just to offset the insomnia of the Paxil. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, and again, you know, like you just said, you know, the, the Paxil causes insomnia, which can drive your anxiety even worse, which again, just drives me absolutely bonkers. Cause like, you know, another one of the side effects of SR is, is like sexual side effects, you know? And so it's like, Hey, you know, sorry, we gave you, you know, this, but take this other pill. That'll help that. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's, and it's a, it's a constant and vicious cycle. Um, you know, and I, I have the same issues cause I also take, Wellbutrin in the mornings and I take Lexapro at night and the Wellbutrin wires me up. 
like absolutely crazy. Um, and if I didn't take a CBD gummy right before I went to bed, I wouldn't be able to sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I take, like I said, I mean, I use CBD for everything now. Um, it, it's That has been a lifesaver, put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, that I, I can relate to the Wellbutrin Lexapro combo. We actually did try that, but it made my anxiety so much worse. So we stopped that like after a couple of weeks. But yeah, I mean, it makes you feel like you're really ready to like crawl out of your skin sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it it works for me because it does it does help me keep me balanced. Um, and, you know, I'll still have my bad days um, where I can barely get out of bed. Um, luckily those are on usually on Saturdays. So I don't know if that's a mental thing or just a tired thing. Um, but that's when usually my, um, like my worst days are. And then my other days, I just get overly manic. Like I'll just be, you know, just word vomit all the time. Just da, 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 da. And it just, I, I don't even know how I manage that. Like I've done episodes of this show in a completely manic state. And I go, what did I say? <laughs> I'll have to go back and listen to it. Like, does that even sound right? Should I just delete this episode? And it, it, it then that drives my anxiety even crazier because it's like I, I can't even control my manic, you know, episodes to where I can control my train of thought at all. It just it's just a constant rotating thing. Um, so you kind of went into it a little bit, but you know, let's go a little dive in a little bit more on why you decided to write the book. I know you said it was you know going into the you know the pandemic and seeing the kind of stuff that happened but I, there's always more to it so what exactly was the the heart and soul of it all so when i had my mental breakdown like at the end of 2019 so it kind of started right after christmas where everything started like really getting crazy and carried through until about like i mean i'm still on the path like out of that but i mean pretty much in the clear at this point so the first couple of months were just terrible um like january and 20 uh february of 2020 and i'm all i'm like trying to get myself out of this this state like i actually have to live with my parents for a couple of months which you know you like you don't really want to be doing as like a 33 year old woman yeah <laughs> but um basically like once i finally got past that point I started going into this whole, like, what is my purpose in life thing? Because, you know, like, we can't just go, we just can't move from one problem into like a nice, clean slate. It's always got to be like one issue into another one. So I had this big self dilemma where it was like, what is my purpose? Like, my job isn't my purpose in life. It's, it, I like my job, but it doesn't fulfill me. And through the time that I, like from when I've been diagnosed up until like I had my mental breakdown, I really felt alone a lot of the time because I didn't think that anybody could even remotely feel how I felt. Like nobody understood my anxiety. I had people before like tell me they didn't even believe me or, you know, stuff like that, which is really annoying um, and discouraging. So I kind of took like my feeling alone and the journey I went through to like get to a place of openness because once I hit that mental breakdown stage, I didn't have a choice but to open up and tell people because if I wanted to see my friends, I had to let them know what was going on. Like, hey guys, I'll come see you, but like my dad's gonna drive me or my mom's gonna drive me because I, I'm not, not okay being alone in the car. So I took that piece of where I started to open up and try and like kind of combined it with like, wait, maybe that's my purpose is like really open up. And as soon as I started doing that more and more, I found that people that I know or acquaintances were experienced the same thing as me or had been diagnosed earlier in life and had been on medication since they were young or in high school. Um, so it was just like a really cool experience to start sharing and then being like, okay, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like this will fulfill me. And through that, I kind of decided to write the book. Um, it took a few more months, but I was just really sitting with it, exploring the idea of how do I combine my experience with my ability to help others and hopefully make their journeys a little 
easier because I don't want other people to get to the point where they feel so far gone and like they have nothing to hold on to and nobody to talk to, to where they have a full breakdown or even worse, where we are talking about like the increased suicide rates. So that was really where it came from a place of like, how do I use this knowledge I've gained through my recovery from this breakdown and combine it with my purpose and like wanting to feel fulfilled. Yeah. Um, again, you just said all the same things that I, I said to myself when I was creating the show. Um, and you know, it was the exact same thing. And I, I, that's so admirable. Let me just say it off the bat. It's so admirable, you know, to meet another person out there, let, you know, that is doing this, the, the same work that I'm doing in, in such a, you know, positive way. So again, thank you for that. Cause that's that, we need more people like you out there. Um, we need more survivors and advocates to to say these things. We don't need therapists and you know doctors saying, "Oh, we no." We need real life, everyday people that experience this trauma and to talk out and talk up to you know people that actually can make change. Because otherwise, we're just going to continue to fall in the same traps over and over and over again, like. Obviously, you and I have both fallen into those traps repeatedly. And how many people haven't gotten out of those traps? How many people have ended their life because of those traps? And that's what we need to put a stop to. And again, you know, people like you are are going to help drive that. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the biggest things, too, is I am blessed, like, unbelievably and so grateful for this but I have the most incredible support system in my family and in my friends and I know that a lot of people don't have that um or may not be comfortable seeing if they have that and what I mean is you know having that first conversation with a friend or family because I know for me in the beginning I felt like I was such a burden on them talking to them about it and just like every day being like, am I ever going to feel like myself again? Am I ever going to be okay? Will this ever get better? And like, I just felt like such a burden. And I think that does scare people a little bit when, you know, maybe they do have amazing friends and family, but they don't think that they would be there for them anymore if they opened up about having a mental health issue. So I, my goal with the book is I want to show people that it's okay you will be okay. And even if they don't have that type of system as is, so they don't, maybe they don't have a lot of friends or they're more of a loner, or they don't have a great relationship with their family. There is someone out there. There are many people out there that would be a support system for them. And it's just opening your mouth and sharing how you're feeling. And you will find that that support system, that group of people that make you feel like you belong. And I think that that's really important for people to recover or to survive or find whatever works for them through, you know, the advice or inspiration of others. Yeah. And I, I, you just stumbled up upon something else that has been a big issue, you know, as far as mental health goes, and that's the stigma around it. Um, You know, whether we think we're going to be a burden or the fact that, you know, people sometimes in your life just refuse to deal with it. You know, I've seen, you know, a, a good friend of mine um, had to, was, was trying to date somebody and he, you know, he deals with depression and anxiety and stuff like that. And he was having a down day, just having a down day. And it, it's not like he was actually suicidal or whatever. And he posted something on his Instagram that was just a little cathartic, you know, Hey, you know, this, whatever, whatever he said, it, it was dark, but it wasn't like, Oh my God, there's something wrong with him. It's like, oh, he's having a, a bad day. No big deal. Let me see if make sure he's okay. But the girl that he was talking to and uh, just started dating took it as a sign of, oh, you're unstable. I cannot, I can't even begin to talk to you anymore. And it's like, wow, you are a bad person. <laughs> you know, and that, that's, that kind of stuff still happens. And I'm like, that, oh, that's horrible. And, and the stigma around it has got to stop. You know, we're normal, just a little weird. <laughs> you know, that's, hey, I prefer being weird. I said, why? Normal's boring. <laughs> I just take weird to a whole other level. Um, but 
Season. Yeah, that again, that right there is just horrific. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite sayings I've seen recently is like mental health is health. If somebody you know in your life has a chronic illness, you're not going to be rude to them because they have a chronic illness. Some mental health disorders are chronic illnesses. They don't go away. Like you're constantly working on them and they are frustrating. And uh, it doesn't make you any less of a person because you have that. And like, I, I felt that way about myself for so long. I actually just wrote an, an article on how to break down the stigmas around mental health and like why that's so important. And I think for a lot of people, it just stems from what they saw and heard growing up because I know like many times when I was younger, you would like see on TV or hear things or like just overhear conversations. People like something's just not right with them well, okay, like, what does that mean? And then also, like, I just think that my parents' generation didn't talk, like, they weren't big touchy-feely, like, talk about feelings type of people. Like, I just think that was the times back then. So yeah. now that people want to talk about it, it can be difficult because maybe they didn't have that growing up. Because I feel like back, like, a couple decades ago, like talking about your feelings wasn't a, a big thing. And now that it's becoming more comfortable, I think it, it's going to be, it's going to take work and people are going to really have to open up from all groups, all ages and start having the conversations, but it is uncomfortable. And sometimes you just have to get uncomfortable because you, you don't know like how much better it'll make you feel until you've talked about it. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes that's the biggest hurdle is just opening your mouth. Um, you you got to put the fear aside and, you know, you, you can't let your own judgment about yourself, you know, decide the judgment of others or if that makes any sense. So you can't think other people are going to judge you because you're judging yourself. No, just talk it out. You know, you, if you hold it in, it's going to be bad, you know. And I'm going to go ahead and use this as an example. Um, Chester Bennington of Lincoln Park. Um, I'm of the, because I've been there. I know what that feeling is like. But again, I don't, I, know, I don't know what everyone else goes through in the moment. So I can't say, you know, oh, if I was them, I would have never done that. I can't say that. I can't say it's a selfish act and they were weak in that moment and that's the fact of it. But like for six months, this man, you know, saw, because he, he was best friends with Chris Cornell of Soundgarden who had com committed suicide earlier mm -hmm. the same year. And he saw all, what his family went through, what his friends went through and saw what everybody around the world went through when Chris Cornell passed away. And yet he still made that decision to do it. Did he talk to anybody else? No, he held it in. And that's how strong these types of th these things can be. Even after you see the hurt and you know the hurt because that was your best friend and you see the, the results of everybody else mourning, you still are so fucked up in your head that you're like, well, the hurt that I'm feeling is nothing compared to what they're feeling. So screw it. I'm going to end it all. And that's the result of not talking about it. That's the result of not being open. That's the result of not being honest. And that's a sad, sad part of the reality that even though you know what the, what the outcome will be, you still make that choice. I feel like people have like feel so much pressure from society to be a certain way which I think especially from celebrities, it's like you can only show yourself in whatever persona you've created. So if you're like supposed to be a badass or like a rocker or you're supposed to be this happy, fabulous person, and like that's what you show because that's what people expect you to show. And so you start to internalize everything that doesn't fit that that personality or that person that you put on for the rest of the world to see. Um, so I think that f like from that standpoint, that is 
very challenging, but you know, uh, us lay people, we do the same thing. And yeah. I just, well, I'll never forget. I had this conversation with my friend, Mikey, who's like literally the best human. And I was sitting in the car with him and we were just talking and I started to talk to him and like voice all the concerns that I had been having for so long. Like, I'm so scared that you guys aren't going to want to be my friend anymore. Like I'm such a burden right now. And I know this is a lot to deal with and da, da, da. And I just remember him grabbing my hand and I'm like crying and he's like, I love you. Like, I'm going to be here for you. I'm not dealing with you. Like you're my friend. That's what I'm here for. And it just made me like really open my eyes. And like, I hate that saying deal with you. You're not dealing with somebody if you care about them. And I had to be told that many, many times. Like, I'm not going to stand on my soapbox and go off about this because I literally thought people were dealing with me for so long. And it just took a lot of telling myself, like, that's not what, that's not reality. Like, these people are your friends. That's what they're there for because you would do the same thing for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a big thing, like how you're mentioning about your friend's girlfriend, like, I'm sorry. We just don't need those people in our life. Like if that person thinks they're dealing with you or they like have, have like this big, like, I don't know, inability to deal with, to be a mature adult and recognize that people have demons and people have things they're working through in life, then we don't need them. Like, bye. You don't need to be in my life. Like, you're just, you're not a mature person. Like, you're not a mature adult. You're uneducated on these topics. And that's not a me problem. And I think that that's really hard for people to see, too. Because, I mean, it was for me. So, I think that, like, the more people are talking about it, the more you're open with friends and family and you see who supports you, you are able to narrow down your circle to be like, okay, these are the people that I'm comfortable with. They will help me while I'm recovering or working through these issues and not bringing excess negativity in where it's not needed. Yeah. Um, that I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, that's a hundred percent accurate there. Um, so let me ask you this. You know, you're a CPA, but yet you're doing all this work with mental health. Do you see yourself staying a CPA forever or you want to change it up and kind of just dedicate your life to this? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I, like I said, I really like what I do now, but I'm just kind of going to see where life takes me uh, because I want to see where the book goes. Like once it's finally come out. I am getting life coach certified. Um, my book coach, she is getting certified to become a certifier and her program starts this summer. So yeah, she's like working on getting to where she can be a certifier. So I'm waiting for that, but she's actually going to uh, launch a course this summer. So I will be getting life coach certified and, you know, seeing where that takes me. And continuing to do things like this. I've lo- I, I love talking to people. I love sharing my stories. Um, so I've been like writing some articles. I want to start a blog and then, you know, just see what kind of connections I can make through that and see where that takes my career because I'm a huge, huge believer that like networking is everything. Yes. So if I continue to have conversations and put myself out there, like you never know where it could take you. So funny parallel, um, my show on Monday where I talked to the life coach, um, she was actually a CPA for 30 years and it eventually broke her to where she um, had a huge mental break and then decided to turn her life around and become a life coach after the fact. So just throwing it out there, that, that shit happens. <laughs> oh, I mean, I know 100%. And yeah, like being a CPA works for me right now. Um, I'm newer to this career because I did go back to grad school later in life, but I think that just putting myself out there and continuing to get education, get certifications and set myself up to work in mental health full time. I mean, ultimately, yeah, that is the dream. Like if I could spend my life helping other people, I would be completely fulfilled every day of my life. Yeah. It's just finding a way to do that and still be able to, you know, pay the bills. (laughs) 
it's not easy. <laughs> I can tell you that much. It's not easy. Um, you know, sometimes the hardest that we'll ever do is to find that career job that doesn't feel like a career job. And sometimes that's the hardest you'll ever work to get to that point. But once you achieve it, the results and the rewards are exponential. So I wish you nothing but the best with it. And I hope this book completely just changes people's lives. You know, if nothing else, one person. Because that's all that matters, right? I mean, if we if we change one person's life, if we make one person realize, hey, I need help, then we did our job. And, you know, that's a... Uh, the of rewarding in itself that's like what i tell people all the time when i'm asked like what are the goals with the book and i'm like if i help one person that's amazing if i help a million people that's also amazing like it's just reaching people and making a positive impact is the purpose behind this and like we just talked about like i have a full-time career so i'm not like hedging my whole life on this but it's just something I felt like I needed to do. So you're right. Like a hundred percent. If I help one person that really has accomplished the goal. So, um, how can people find out more about you and, um, when can they, when and where can they get the book? <clears throat> so you can check me out on my Instagram. It's Carrie Thompson author or on my Facebook page at Carrie Thompson author. I will be setting up a author website soon, which will be shared on both of those platforms when it comes out. And my book right now it is available for pre-sale on Amazon. It's for on sale for 99 cents until the release date. So if you're an ebook reader, you are able to get the book there at the pre-sale price, which will go up on the 10th. And um, you can also purchase the paperback on Amazon. It will be available for purchase on the 10th. So ebook now and then paperback on the 10th officially. Cool. So the links for everything for Carrie will be in the, the description and video of this um, podcast, including the link for the book and the ebook. Um, just click it right there and we'll be able to uh, be able to see what you can do and everything else. Go and follow her on Facebook and Instagram. And again, Carrie, you are an inspiration to a lot of different people, whether you realize it or not. And I hope that this book does what it wants, was what it wants for does what you want it to do for you. And that in the next few years, you know, you've helped a lot of people. And I know that that will happen for you. Thank you so much, Derek. It's been awesome talking to you. And I'm so excited to see where your podcast takes you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. But um, again, thank you very much. And guys, thank you very much for being here on this Thursday. Come back tomorrow on the Friday edition of Suck It Podcast. But until then, stay healthy, stay happy, and as always, stay heavy. We'll see you guys later. Peace.